So good morning, Discovery Church. It is um, really, really good to see everybody here today, and um, I'm really happy to be here to share the message that um, that God uh, put on my heart, and it's a continuation of our summer um, series about God's anointed. So I'm going to ask you a question to start off. Who is a person that you look up to the most? So I just want you to think for a moment about that person and just think about what it is about them, what um, values or character traits, uh, you know, what is it that, that, that leads you to really think highly of them and, and admire them? So in my first year of university, I had a roommate and she left a very strong imprint on me. She really caused me to look at myself and to examine myself and recognize um, that there was actually a character trait that was missing from me, from my life. So this teenage girl had something called integrity. Allison was honest. She told the truth. And I don't even think she was capable of telling a lie. She was just the same person everywhere she went, no matter who was with her, she was unchanging. And this led me to really kind of change how I was, at least in her presence, I found myself becoming more honest. And she just held herself to this high moral standard. And she held to it, even in the face of all kinds of peer pressure and you know, probably a lot of temptation, and she was just really, really um, different. And I think that that's what made Allison so striking, was that she was an anomaly. Like, in this sort of murky water with all these rocks with sharp edges, she was like a, like glistening through the ripples, like a smooth, bright stone, and she gave stable footing to those who were on her path. So integrity is honesty without compromise. It is doing the right thing no matter who's looking, no matter if nobody's there. And humility, um, which is also something that Allison had, humility is the quality or the state of being humble. So um, it's sort of the opposite of pride and arrogance and haughtiness. It is not thinking badly of yourself. It's not putting yourself down. That would be self-degradation. It's simply recognizing that everything that we are and everything we have, we, everything good that we have comes from God. So it's giving credit where credit's due. Um, you know, we, the word says that, you know, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. So we don't need to go around saying how wonderful we are, but we also do want to hold true to the promises that God has about us and says about us, which is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. Now, lying, <laughs> lying or dishonesty, it sort of seems to be an accepted part of our culture, doesn't it? So I just want you to think about this for a minute. <laughs> lying, which is deception, and dishonesty, so corruption, is really saturated into our society. It's, it's sometimes hard because sometimes it comes from a place of fear. And recently, I actually this week, I heard this twice. I heard this exact same thing twice, so I'm going to tell you, because I think maybe it's something for not just me to hear, that f there's fear and there's love. And f out of fear is born anxiety, hatred, uh, divisiveness, um, all kinds of jealousy, all kinds of negative things. Love, out of love, we get peace and joy and, and patience and goodness, right? The fruit of the Spirit is a good example. And God is love. And his word says, 
that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And that um, there is no fear in love. This perfect love drives out fear. So whenever we are plugged into God, whenever we are um, connected into God and walking by the Spirit, we're not going to experience chronic fear in all those times. We still, if there's like a bear chasing us, we're still going to have like the fight or flight response. We're still going to get scared. That's natural and healthy. (laughs) But to walk around feeling fear of failure and fear of judgment and fear of, you know, this and those kinds of fears, right? Very human to feel those ways. But when we actually are filled with God's spirit and walking by the spirit and in God's word and in prayer, you know, daily, we will find that we're experiencing more of a, of a fulfilling of love rather than fear. Now, sometimes we, f- we lie out of fear. So maybe like as a kid, you try in your mom's high heel shoes, you stomp around the house a little too hard, break the heel, tuck it back into the closet, hide it behind some clothes, and when she asks you about it, you blame your brother. Other times, we might rationalize. Um, so this paper, right, or this book or these pens from work, they would really come in handy with my kids' homework assignments. So I'm just going to take them home and use them for that purpose without checking with somebody first or without paying for it. Um, maybe we steal by going on social media during work time or working on our resume during work time. And I mean, it's still stealing if we're doing non-work work work during work time, isn't it? (laughs) Really? These are just some things to think about when we're talking about integrity. It can be even harder to have integrity when the stakes are high, when we have a lot more to lose, or when we have people telling us that, you know, telling us to do something that we actually know is wrong. Or maybe we don't really know what the right thing is, and we don't know what's right or wrong in that moment or with that decision, but we do feel pressured to do something. So if you can relate to any of those things, then this message is for you. It could even be that you've been wronged. There's been an injustice, and you feel like, you know, you just want to take matters into your own hands. You know the right, you know, you're like, I know how to get justice in this situation. So that's another situation um, that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 24 today, and we're going to contrast two people that we have been looking at this summer, David, King David, who at this point isn't king yet, and King Saul, who is king at this point. They were both anointed by God for the special purpose of being king. And so anointed, they, that means that God um, selected them uh, for this special job of being king, um, the kings of Israel, but at different times. Okay, so right now, King Saul is currently king. However, even though God anointed both of them for the same special purpose, there is a major difference between the two men that impact the course of their lives impacts their family, impacts their futures. We're going to look at that today. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory because I'm not sure how many of you heard um, the first sermons leading into this um, and that Martin pre- preached, um, and I'm not sure if you're that familiar with First Samuel. So backstory is, at this point, King Saul had been relentlessly pursuing David, hunting him down and trying to kill him. And this started ever since Saul disobeyed God. He, got, he became very jealous of David. He had a tormenting spirit come on him, and he threw a spear at David. At that point, David started to run. He started to flee <laughs> to get away from David or from Saul, which makes total sense. That's that natural fear that kicks in. Got to get away from you know imminent death. And um, so he started going into hiding to get away from Saul's attacks. Now, Saul's corrupt thinking and his dishonest, dishonesty, really, it came out, we can see it really clearly, when he actually lied and he said that David was trying to kill him, when actually Saul was going after David. 
And so Saul became very paranoid, and he really believed, I, I think he really believed this at, at one point, um, and he was telling all of his men, he was telling people that, you know, David's trying to kill me. He even enlisted his own son, Jonathan, Saul's own son, Jonathan, to try to go and kill David, and David and Jonathan were best friends. Jonathan, by the way, was another Allison. He was a man of integrity, and even when he recognized that you know, there were things that his dad was doing that was harming other people, he pointed it out, and he said it. He just said it. You know, he didn't tuck it away and try and hide it and cover up, and, um, and he helped David to escape from his dad, too, from his own dad. So Saul, you're wondering, why was he anointed to be king then? <laughs> but he didn't start out like this, okay? He started out with, as a humble man. He started out um, considering God and God's ways. But then something happened along the way. He started to fear man over God. He started to be more concerned about what people thought than what God thought. And so he took matters into his own hands on a couple of occasions, and he blatantly disobeyed God. God wasn't having any of that. We're gonna talk, though, later on about that whole thing, because what God do does at this point is he actually removes his spirit from Saul. He had put his spirit on Saul, and now he takes it away. And he sends a tormenting spirit, which is something Pastor Martin talked about a few weeks ago. Why would God send a tormenting spirit to a man that he'd anointed? Doesn't really kind of make sense. We think of maybe the enemy doing that, sending demons, right? But to think that God would do that? And I racked my brain thinking, why would God do that? And the only thing that came to me, which may or may not be the case, and remember, God's sovereign, he's above all, so he knows what we don't know. But it could be that that was a last-ditch effort or some kind of attempt for God to... You know, sometimes when we go to our very deepest depths, that's when we recognize, oh, <laughs> you know what? Maybe something I'm doing isn't right. Maybe i got to change. Maybe i got to turn back to God, right? Maybe it was a way for him to try to, you know, show Saul how bad he could feel and to try to get him to turn back to God. I'm not sure. That's just something that, that came to me. But regardless, um, at this point in time, this is where Saul was at. And David, who had been like a son to him, David, who had slayed the giant for him, David, who had played the harp to soothe him while he was being tormented by this tormenting spirit, and it was the only thing at that time that gave him relief, David became Saul's target. Saul did not consider God at this point, and this wasn't good. So let's read, we're going to read through um, chapter 24 in 1 Saul. So after Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, the Philistines were a group of people that were fighting against the Israelites, and David and Saul were, were Israelites, they were Jewish. Um, so after Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. When I read that, I thought, Star Wars, that sounds like Jedi. But <laughs> I don't really know a lot about Star Wars, but I remember Jedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel, and he went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goat. So you have one man named David doing nothing wrong. And the king of Israel, with all the power, <laughs> enlists 3,000 elite fighter troops to go and search after this one man. Like, to me, that seems extreme. Like, really, do you need that? Wouldn't two people be enough? Anyways, I guess it's kind of like, yeah, hard to find him. But um, at the place uh, where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. That is a fancy way of saying doing number one or two. So as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. They're all excited. It's like, there he is. He's right there in the same cave that we're in and his pants are down. You can just get him. He's like not looking at you. So... 
um, David creeps forward and he cuts off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. That's how close he is to the man who's hunting him down. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had, Saul's, he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. <laughs> Surprise, look who was in the cave with you. <laughs> and you didn't know it. Then he shouted to Saul, why do you listen to people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day, you can see with your own eyes, it isn't true for the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of the men, some of my men, they told me to kill you, but I spared you for I said, I will never harm the king. He's the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand, it is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. It's like, I was right next to you. You weren't looking. I could have stabbed you in the back. I could have disarmed you. I could have disabled you. I could have done anything I wanted to you. And nobody would have blamed him. Probably not. <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't kill you. This proves that I'm not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. He says, may the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you're trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. And we'll skip down to, to verse 15. In that same passage, David continues. He says, may the Lord therefore judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He is my advocate and he will rescue me from your power. In this passage, David is given an uncanny almost unexplainable, too coincidental <laughs> opportunity to do away with his enemy. I mean, really, what are those chances? Like the man, he's been hunting him down, he's been pursuing him relentlessly, plaguing his life, threatening to kill him, and he wanders into the exact same cave. And David's men encourage him to take this opportunity to do with him as he wishes. It is a perfect setup. How many of us have hoped for something like that to happen? You know, somebody that's, you know, harmed us or wronged us, and here we have an opportunity to get back at them. Maybe not in that extreme physical sense, but it's happened for David. And yet David's conscience gets to him. And he recognizes that he should not attack the Lord's anointed one because the Lord himself chose Saul for a purpose. And, and David's faith in God and the conviction about God's sovereignty, God's all-powerfulness, spills out of David here. David is convicted in his spirit, and God's spirit is still on him. Okay, God hadn't taken his spirit from David. Um, so he's convicted to honor God above all else, above his own wants and desires and needs, above Saul's wants and desires and needs, above his men's wants and desires and needs. He places God's wants and desires and ways. He could have thought about himself in that moment, but he was moved through his faith to obedience to God. Sometimes, what seems like an opportunity for us to take matters into our own hands and, and carry out our own version of justice is really God giving us an opportunity to place that situation in God's hands and trust God, God's divine justice in those moments. The Bible says God will settle the score. 
God will settle the score. Proverbs 20:21 20, says, don't ever say I'll get you for that. Wait for God, he'll settle the score. And David chose to trust God and respect his ways. Even though there's this man who was causing incredible mental anguish to him, by obeying God in that cave, it meant that his adversary would be free to continue to stalk and harass him. Saul had not actually succeeded in physically harming David, but can you imagine the emotional toll that David would have been going through through all this time? You know, it, it, it's actually... <laughs> Saul's relentless pursuit of David is a lot like an abuser pursuing their victim. And you might relate to some of the feelings that David had. A constant state of fight-or-flight mode, frustration and hurt by being lied to by a person who was like a father figure to him, who was, who was in a place of authority over him, who he once was very close with. He's best friends with his son, and he's married to his daughter. This is family. Saul appeared to realize that he's, his wrongs when he was confronted, when David confronted him, which he did a few times, um, Saul actually suddenly spoke very highly of David to his face, and he, he promised things would be different, <laughs> and then he did it all over again. That's the cycle of abuse. David didn't just stay like a sitting duck, though. He actually set some healthy boundaries and ran for his life. But man, did he ever hold to that moral compass that he had. And here's, here's what else David did in this moment. This struck me as like, it's almost like a double integrity. I don't think that's a word, but um, it's kind of like double jeopardy. But David didn't just resist the temptation to harm or disable Saul. He actually goes one step further and he actually boldly confronts him with the truth. He has a piece of his hem, uh, the hem of his robe in his hand, right? It's like, you're telling people I'm trying to kill you. You're telling people, it's like you're trying to justify going after me, but guess what? Right in this moment, I could have and I didn't, so you are faced with the reality of the truth. There's no getting around that. He holds them accountable. Now back in, oh, um, right. The other thing I want to say, though, is that, yes, David did the right thing. He was ruled by his faith in God. Um, we know that in the short term, if he had killed Saul in that cave, it could have ended all that stalking and chasing and fear for his life, potentially, at least by Saul. Um, but, but God trusted in, in, or sorry, David trusted in God's sovereignty and God's justice, right? And Saul did wind up receiving divine justice because the anointing on him was removed. The anointing for the, this kingship to go through his bloodline was removed and it was placed on David. And it was through David's bloodline that we got Jesus. And Jesus is the king of kings, right? He is our true king for, to the end of time. That's divine justice. Now back in David and Saul's time, this was before Jesus came to earth as both man and God. And God would often send his spirit on people, like he did with Saul, like he did with David, for special purposes. Maybe he had a special role for them to play, or he needed to give them special strength or empowerment. Um, but God could also remove, as we see with Saul, remove his spirit also. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then the moment that you believed, you received the Holy Spirit, right? If you um, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God did raise him from the dead, then you are saved, you have salvation. And in that moment, Jesus promised his disciples, he, um, you know, when he was still walking the earth after his resurrection, he spent 40 days, right, with his disciples, and you know, and he told them the Great Commission, which is the good news, right? Um, which is the news about salvation and that our hope is in Jesus because he took all of our sins on the cross, hung them on there using his body, 
so that we can have forgiveness of our sins and eternal salvation. That is the free gift of God, and there's nothing we need to do to earn that salvation. We don't need to work for it. It's a free gift. And nothing that you do can remove your salvation, right? If you have that belief, we can stifle the Holy Spirit. We can squelch it. We can lose out on the full um, power of God. We can be limited in God's power and what he can do in our life. If we don't obey the Holy Spirit, if we don't listen, we shut it out. We shut him out. The Holy Spirit's a person, the person of God in spirit form. Um, but we won't lose our salvation. But, but we can experience a more fulfilling life, a more peace-filled life, even in the midst of trials. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And I'm just going to read Luke 24 for a second here, um, verses 44 to 49. So this is actually what Jesus said to his disciples after he had... Um, been resurrected, okay? And he was with them, and it's before he ascended up to heaven. He said, when I, was, I, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is all prophesied. Jesus coming, he is the Messiah, was all prophesied. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He gave them a, a clear understanding of the scriptures that they hadn't previously had as to who he really is. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. And it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. That means just turning away from our sins, turning back to God. You are witnesses of all these things. So forgiveness is available to everyone who are, we are human, we're going to sin, God knows that. Um, but we just can confess our sins and ask God for forgiveness, we are forgiven. And we are saved. So on our own, we're going to mess up on our own, we're not going to be ever perfect, but with God, and God is perfect in him and us, then we can do all things through Christ Jesus. So I want you to watch out, though, for something. So if, if we receive God's forgiveness, we receive it, we ask for it, the guilt that we have should lift. If it, if, if it persists, that could be shame. And shame is more thinking, not just I did a bad thing, but I am bad. I am unworthy. I am not good enough. I am not good. Those are, those are from the enemy. Okay? Those thoughts are from the enemy. And we need to... Um, we need to fight against those words with the truth of who God says we are. Forgiven, redeemed, loved. There's a lot of good words, a lot of good things God says about us because we are his cho children and we are chosen by him. So the more that we come to know God and his love for us, the more that we're going to experience gratitude and it's out of our love for Jesus that we're compelled to do good works, not out of fear of retribution, but out of love. Right before Jesus ascended back up to heaven, he promised his followers that he would send an advocate. This is the Holy Spirit, right? So he would send an advocate, his own spirit dwelling among them. And this promise is true of us as well. So I'm just going to quickly read um, John 14, verses 15 to 17. <clears throat> Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. He said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Greatest commandments can, be, that can just all be summed up in love God with your um, whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So love God and love people, biggest main commandments of Jesus. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate who will never leave you. You hear that? The Holy Spirit will never leave you. Jesus said that. He will never leave you. So if you're afraid that, the Holy, that God's going to take the Holy Spirit away from you, nah. 
Don't fear that because it's not true. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Just want to reassure you with that. (laughs) So, the world is riddled with deception. We've talked about that, right? There's sin. Um, There's an enemy, and he's like a prowling lion. He's looking for someone to devour. But we have God on our side. So, as long as we, ha- we need to have that proper perspective of let's everything we do, let's do it for God. Let's imagine God's watching us, because he is. <laughs> um, and he's watching because he cares about us. He wants to correct us. He wants to lead us on the right path. And just let's let everything that we do, let, if we think about it, that let everything we do glorify God, And if we walk by the Spirit and we pray and we read the Word of God, we meditate on it, that's how we're going to know what God has to say about our decisions, about these really tricky, maybe moral decisions that we have. Um, Well, we might be tested, and that could be a whole test that David was in, a test. How is he going to respond in that cave? Right? How many people think he passed the test? Okay. (laughs) Some people, that's good. I think he passed too. Um, I would only wonder and hope and think, would I do the same thing? But we do have a choice. We can either take matters into our own hands or we can see what God has to say and trust his divine judgment, his divine justice. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we just come before you humbled, by your sovereignty, humbled by your power, humbled by your mercy and your grace. Lord God, um, and totally, completely grateful that there is nothing we need to do other than believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord to be saved. And that as soon as we believe, we do receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised us we have this advocate. And Lord, thank you that nothing can separate us from your love through Christ Jesus. Nothing. Lord, thank you that um, we have forgiveness of our sins, Lord. And I pray that you help us to walk with integrity, to even in this sinful, deceptive, lying, corrupt world that we live in, that we still have a choice to walk in the light of Christ, to walk by faith and to experience what it's like to be sons and daughters of integrity. In Jesus' name, amen.